Hey everyone, I want to talk all about my journey with sensory motor, how I reach sensory motor recovery, also known as somatic OCD, also known as hyper awareness, everything I went through, tinnitus, blinking, swallowing, salivating, hyper awareness of my thumbs, hyper awareness of my consciousness. Now I look back, I did have some sort of hyper awareness of my bladder when I was going to the bathroom, trying to force going to the bathroom multiple times a night. How I got to where I am today, why unconditional life acceptance is the most important factor when it comes to sensory motor recovery, why it's really easy to get this particular fear wrong, how I have no fear cycle at all, why it doesn't mean no, the number one goal is to never notice your sensations again, this is incorrect, why self-reassuring statements don't work long-term and everything else in between. Before I go any further, please subscribe, hit that like button down below. Just let me know what you think about this. Please ask as many comments as you want. If you're interested in our coaching services, please email us at info at ostrecovery.com and we will get back to you in a timely fashion. So my whole entire life, I've, I've had OCD behaviors, but it didn't become chronic until June 2019. So coming up on four years ago. Um, I took me about two and a half years to really recover from sensory motor. I'd say I've been recovered for well over a year now, 18 months, maybe a little bit longer. And that doesn't really matter to me anymore. And that's how you know you really reach late stages of recovery, and especially regarding specific themes such as sensory motor. Now, it started with tinnitus. That's when I woke up in the middle of the night. Many people have heard me talk about this. And I compulsively went to audiologists. I was compulsively checking the pressure in my ears. I wouldn't use headphones. I, you know, I would read all the studies. I knew as a professional when it came to ear damage. I knew everything about the anatomy of the ear, the physiology of the ear, how your, how your cochlear nerve, everything can affect everything from balance to, to vestibular problems. I knew it all. Plus, I also was in, um, was in Cairo school, so I was learning all this anyway, but it became very obsessive. I watched every single thing on the American Tennis Association and remember the one guy being like, oh my gosh, if I can't even imagine having tonight, how horrible that would be. And that would kind of instill the fear. And then three, four months later, after numerous hospital visits, no sleep, multiple panic attacks, I found a book called Rewiring Tinnitus, um, which I thought was a really good book. I remember watching interviews of the guy who wrote that, realizing now looking back, the reason why he was still not recovered from his tinnitus or tinnitus, I'm gonna call it tinnitus for the remainder of the video, is because he still had a fear of noticing it, but he did become much more comfortable. So I used some of these techniques that he had in the book and I became more comfortable. Now, when I look back, some of it was probably compulsive, but I did have a more deeper understanding of the sound being present. Then when I was driving, I got latched to blinking OCD and my whole entire life took a turn for the worst in a matter of seconds. That was another boom light switch moment. And then uh, three months later, I was in the mental hospital. I wanted to kill myself. So I went to the mental hospital for four days. It was in Florida, in America, called the Involuntary Baker Act. The first 30 hours, I was in the holding room with nothing but a plastic mattress and the camera. And people were coming in. And I'm like, look, I can't stop thinking about my blinking. I can't stop thinking about my uh, other sensations. I'm having panic attacks. They didn't know what was going on. They tried to diagnose me with bipolar. This was obviously incorrect. Um, they had to call my family members and everything like that. Even if I have bipolar, we'll go down that route. How do you know you don't have it? Even if I have bipolar, it's not the end of the world. People live a moderately contentful life with having bipolar. We have medications nowadays and other types of stuff. And the, and the principles that we use by Ellis are for all sorts of mental health disorders, OCD, PTSD, anxiety-based disorders. Um, we don't speak about eating problems a lot, but I struggled a lot with that. Uh, a lot of eating problems, kind of my macros every day for 10 years, exercising by dysmorphia. So the principles of unconditional self-life and other acceptance, which come from stoicism, primarily stoicism, these tools are not for particular people. They're for everyone to apply for their situation, whether it's real or not. Uh, I had met Rob when I left the mental hospital, but I didn't listen to anything he said at OCD Recovery for about six months. I still played video games compulsively. I still was engaging in lots of uh, pornography, compulsive behaviors, smoking behaviors, drinking, not going to work, running from my sensations, complaining a lot, uh, a lot of cyber sex addiction stuff, constantly sexting other women and doing all sorts of stuff. I, I, my whole fucking life was a moving compulsion. Um, one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, which then later on I had to work on unconditional self-acceptance, except when I did all these things, and then that's how I got better. So. What I didn't realize at the time 
was everything I was doing, all the behaviors I was doing was to run from my sensations. So that obviously wasn't going to work. So I had to take a step back and realize, well, wait a second, I'm running so bad from these sensations. What happens if I don't try to run from them anymore and I try to change my perspectives on these sensations? Now that took me time. Now how did I do that? I'll show you. So the first thing I had to do was I had to get this book on the reading list. So I had to order this book and read it a few times. And the 90, page 96, 97 that I talk about a lot, the dip sheet, the disputing your irrational belief sheet, I had to go through this many times. Many times I did it compulsively. Many times I wishy-washied it. And this is what it looks like for sensory motor. So I want you to plug and chug anything that you have. I call them the big five. Blinking, breathing, swallowing, saliva, and heartbeat. This also goes for hyper awareness of your bladder, reproductive organ function. It could be hyper awareness of your, your sphincter. It could be hyper awareness of the bridge of your nose, your hairline, anything. It doesn't have to be an internal function. That's what sensory motor really was, but it's about any type of sensation. So the activating event for me was swallowing and saliva. Those ones last the longest, about two years, constant. It is absolutely horrible, 100% horrible to notice my saliva and swallowing for the remainder of my life. I can't stand noticing my sensations for the remainder of my life. Life is not worth living if I have to notice these sensations for the remainder of my life. And then that equals C. Remember, A plus B equals C. Most people in life think activating events are the primary drivers of consequence, such as depression or anxiety or anger. This is not true. Yes, they play a part, sometimes bigger than others, but if 100 people got into a motor vehicle collision in the same intersection, the same way, not all 100 people are going to act the same way. 10 people might be like, fuck, I'm not going to be able to go to work. Six people might be, might be like, yes, I hate my car, new car, insurance money. The activating event is the same. The belief system is dictating primarily the emotional consequence. Now, it takes time to understand this. I hear a lot of people come and go, read the books, didn't work for me. If you think you're going to come in here and read a book, you think you're going to practice this lightly, this is a total different lifestyle perspective that takes years. It doesn't mean you're going to be chronically suffering for years, but it takes a few years of ups and downs and small perspective shifts and little tweaks here and there. I hear people say, oh, th what, they, what they do is way too easy. It's not easy. It's really fucking hard. It's really difficult. It took me a long time to get to where I am today, which is much, much, much more comfortable with any scenarios happening in my life. I could develop a POCD fear tomorrow for all the, who knows, serious real event POCD. I could have a um, harm OCD surrounding Erica and wanting to murder her in the middle of the night. Who knows? I could develop harm OCD, hit and run OCD, all this stuff. You have no idea. These tools prepare you, give you insight to breaking down the irrational beliefs that fuel the system. Now, when I went over to my disputing, now mind you, you will want to write this on paper. Where is the evidence to support that noticing my saliva and swallowing sensations is horrible? Well, it's certainly frustrating and it's definitely distracting. And I'm not going to be able to force the present moment. We're going to talk about that present moment when I'm done with this. Can I really not stand it? Well, this is silly. Of course I can stand it because I'm still here standing. I don't like it, but of course I can stand it. Okay. Is it logical to say that I can't stand it? No, it's not logical whatsoever. It makes no sense. Is it logical to say that it's the worst thing ever? No, you could chop my leg off with a bone saw with no anesthesia, and I'm pretty sure that would suck. Or some forms of torture, or tyranny, or famine, or starvation, or constant torture over and over again, like a Saw movie or a hostile movie. These things happen out there. There are things. It's, and a lot of people confuse this. These are stoic principles of gratitude and gratefulness. You're not doing this to make yourself feel better. You're doing it to realize how lucky you are to have what you have because there are situations out there that are much worse. There are terminal cancers out there that you can't get better from. My father had stage four pancreatic cancer. It's a cancer it's really hard to get better from. And this goes into your behaviors, which could be social avoidance, not taking care of yourself, being extra aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you develop your effective new philosophy, which is the philosophy I have now about sensory motor or any sensations, okay, it would be bad or unfortunate to be stuck with my sensations forever. It would be bad and unfortunate for it to come back with the same severity, but it's still not 100% awful. I don't like it, but I can stand it. Looking at this, slowly chipping away, changing your behaviors, changing the automatic um, 
uh, uh, analyzation that you're doing. And a lot of stuff about rumination, people say to me, well, Nick, I can't stop thinking about my sensations. That's because you're scared about noticing them. Once you become less scared of noticing, say, your saliva, swallowing, breathing for the remainder of your life, you break down some of those health-related fears. Well, Nick, I have breathing OCD and I'm, I'm so scared that I'm going to become so hyperventilating, I'm going to pass out, hit my head and die. Well, we all die one day and if you pass out from hitting your head and dying of an aneurysm or a subdural hematoma, that's not the end of the world. Your world's dead anyway, so you won't know anyway. We're not promised life. We're not promised a long, prosperous life. We're not promised a good economy. We're not promised good um, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, atmosphere. We're not promised anything. We're not promised no good health. We're not promised our children not passing away. We're not promised not dying in a car accident. It's very hard to see that in the moment, but in time, that's how you develop those perspectives. Now, like I said, I wanted to spend some time about some myths surrounding this trying to force the present moment. It's, it's, it's very unproductive. It's not going to work. Forcing the present moment. I always tell people, when do people sleep the best? When they, they naturally just, when they sleep, right? If they're trying to force sleep too much, nothing wrong with having some sleep hygiene. But if you're trying to force it too much, it does the opposite. And that's like anything. Trying to force success. It's a great Taoism quote. If you stand into a river and the stream's pushing up to your chest and you're pushing against the stream and you're like, stop it. Like it's not going to do anything. It's not going to stop until the stream stops flowing because of a river. I mean, because of a, a flash flood or whatever it may be in that example. You're not going to be able to stand outside in the rain and go, stop raining. You could do that, but you're going to look a little crazy. And trying to force the present moment is the biggest mistake I see when it comes to sense from recovery. The other thing that's unfortunate about sensory motor is I see a lot of people trying to explain sensory motor from the perspective of, oh, well, you know, it's just you're afraid of being stuck for the remainder of your life. Yes, but they don't know the ins and outs of it. They actually don't understand how it works. I see a lot of people trying to copy the stuff, which is slightly dangerous because if you don't really know what you're doing, if you've never really had OCD, it's really hard to understand it because... Anyone who has OCD, especially sensory motor, blinking, breathing, swallowing, heartbeat, blah, 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 bladder, they know the typical exposure gold standard, their nonsense doesn't work. Exposures are not the gold standard for any OCD fear. They're the closest gold standard they could be is maybe for contamination. But if you have a contamination fear of contaminating a family member and, the, and them dying and being your fault, the exposures can target it, but it's not going to change that deeply held belief of you being a bad person if you kill them by mistake by contaminating them. So yes, they matter, but they're certainly not the gold standard. This is just a pure anecdote. We know it's not true. And literature doesn't encompass everything. I see, I read sensory motor research. It's total nonsense. I've never read any good sensory motor research out there. Nothing, not one good article on it. Um, because it's not easy to understand. And I, I don't mean to be brash about that or be abrupt, but it is important to highlight that because I hear stuff like, just don't, <laughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm still on the backside being sick a little bit. Um, don't ruminate. Just don't ruminate. Just don't think about your sensations. Just be present. Oh, of course. But now I'm hearing people use the verbiage, right? But they still don't explain it properly. They go, oh yeah, you're just scared of being stuck forever. And then they're like, well, what do I do about that? Oh, you know, just have to break that down. But they don't really understand what they're doing. And, 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 and that's a problem, right? Because then a lot of people with sensory motor become hopeless. And they feel like they don't know what they're doing. So the belief is the driving factor. The automatic rumination of your sensation, aka the automatic hypersensitivity to the awareness of it, will have to be worn as your core fear comes down. As your core fear comes down, the fear of being stuck for the remainder of your life, and you decrease your compulsions and avoidance behaviors, then the automatic sensitivity and hyper-awareness comes down with it. Usually, there could be lag periods. There's no right or wrong here. There's no set formula. Um, and I do want to end it with this. A lot of people say stuff like sensory motor recovery means this to me. Nope. There's only one definition of sensory motor recovery. There's no fear whatsoever. It has nothing to do with never noticing your sensations again. What happens if you're out hiking a mountain with me and your number one goal is, I don't want to ever notice my breathing again. Well, that's not acceptance. That's certainty. My certainty of never noticing it again. It's getting comfortable with the sensation being present. The sensations have always been there. They're always going to be, be there. You're going to breathe, salivate, swallow. Your heart's going to beat. Your bladder's going to become full and unfull. Your thumbs are going to be there. Your bridge of your nose isn't moving. 
All those things are going to be present for the remainder of your life. Until you change your perspectives on those, sensory motor will have an upper hand on you. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is a very, very passionate topic of mine. I no longer suffer with sensory motor OCD. There is no chronic anxiety related to it. No fear cycle. No chronic hyper-awareness. Yes, I'm out hiking the mountains. I've become a little bit hyper in my breathing, but that's how it goes. I don't have to prove to myself I don't have to do maintaining mantras. I don't have to force the present moment. Sometimes I'm present, like I'm really present right now. Sometimes I'm not. I'm doing something I'm bored with. That's how it goes. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, have a great day.